Hi everybody, welcome to our Swan Bank Bible study. It's great to welcome you again. Just a reminder, if you're new to us, that at 12.30 today we will be doing a Zoom meeting where we talk a little bit more around the Bible passage that we've been looking at. So if you want to uh, go to our link here, um, it'll send you through to our website where you can sign up and get the information you need. Please join us if you can. So we're going to continue with Psalm 139. We looked at the first half of it last week. We're going to conclude uh, this psalm this week. And as a way in, let's pray. Lord God, we are really enjoying exploring the psalms together. Again, we pray that you would speak words of truth and encouragement to us. We want to grow with you. And so as we share together today, as we listen now, for those of us who will share together in the discussion later, we pray that you would speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we look at some more of Psalm 139, I'm going to share to begin with uh, from verse 13. For you formed my inmost parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. That I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed in me, when none of them yet existed. I wonder what comes to your attention as you look at those few verses, so 13 through to 16. We're reminded, aren't we, in these verses that God hasn't just been interested in us and God isn't just interested in us. God created us and we see that very much expressed in those words of David. He gives it to us in quite particular language, doesn't he? You formed my inmost parts. You wove me or knit me together in my mother's womb. He's taking us purposefully back to before we were born. He's wanting to give us that image of God who doesn't just know us and is interested in, in us as we're born, but was involved before we were born. And that creates some interesting thoughts and indeed some interesting dilemmas for us as well as we think about the worth of life pre-birth. What does this reading say to us about the importance of life? about the sanctity of life, about God who's involved in our lives before we're born. This can give us some quite interesting uh, ethical dilemmas, can't it? Um, that idea of, of being woven or knit together, as some of the interpretations say as well, I think give us an image of, of something that is intricately formed, something that is really carefully made. The version uh, I have before me, well, I've got two versions before me, and one uses the word of being knit together and the other as being woven together. There's something of, of, a, of a picture that's being brought together, there's something beautiful that's being created. And then as we, as we read on, then it might just give us um, some thoughts around how should our awareness and our acknowledgement of the miracle of our own creation, how should that translate into how we live the life that God has given us? If we have been carefully made, if we have been intricately woven, even before we were born, then what does that mean for our lives? For how we value the life that God has given us, for how we use the life that God has given us. If, if our frame, as the Bible puts it, wasn't hidden from God when we were made in secret, if God 
has carefully created us. If God's eyes saw our unformed substance, if our, our days were written in the book of life before one of them came to be, then God is involved. God is interested. What does that mean for us in our lives? And not just for us. If we translate that, I know it's in the my and the I, but if we translate that into others as well, then how does this speak into how we value others? How does this speak into science that wants to create perfect babies? What does that mean? What does perfect creation mean in God's eyes? Because it strikes me that Psalm 139 gives a different angle to that which might be, might be claimed in the world's eyes today. Those who are wanting to be perfect, who are wanting to have perfect children, who are wanting to be those who are seen in the world's eyes as being perfect. It strikes me that God has a very different picture of that than the one the world might want to speak to us. So how should we value God's creation of one another? And if we continue on, verse 16. According to verse 16, even before we were born, God had a plan for our lives. So this, in a sense, moves us beyond the creation that God has made, but takes us into God's plan for our being, God's purpose for us, his, his interest in our comings and our goings. Just as an inventor of something would be interested in how that invention unfolds, how it's used, then so God is interested in how our lives unfold, how we develop, how we go forward. What happens with this creation that God has made? God doesn't just create and then disappear. God creates and is interested. And indeed, if we take the words of verse 16, all, all the days, all of the days that we have lived, that we continue to live, that we will live are written in God's book. So what does that say to us? about how we might reach our God-given potential and how God is involved in our lives to help us to fulfill our potential, to find it, to discover it and to fulfill it. So I guess a big question from, from this psalm is what does it look like for us to fulfill our God-given potential? Have you reached it yet? Have I? I don't think so. And then if we read on, how precious are your thoughts to me, O oh God? How vast is the sum of them? If I should count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. And when I awake, I am still with you. Looking at these verses within the context of what we've seen in the rest of the psalm, what might cause us, us, to be interested in God's thoughts? There's a little bit of a shift here, isn't there? How precious are your thoughts to me, O oh God? If we realise that God is with us every moment of our lives, if we realise God was there even before we came into being, we would probably be very concerned with how God is interested in us, how God thinks of us, how God intends us to be, what God's thoughts are about us. And then the final verses of this psalm. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. Depart from me, therefore, bloodthirsty people, for they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. I'm going to stop there before we get to the final two verses. I, I'm always a bit sad when the, when the Psalms go into something like this. We have some beautiful words and then suddenly we get onto hatred and bloodthirstiness. And I, I'm always tempted to kind of just leave those bits to one side. They seem so out of place 
within these kind of psalms and yet they're there. And for me, as I read those verses, I think there's something about David expressing his desire to be rid of, free from those things that he would say are not of God. Those influences, those distractions that would seek to pull him away from the goodness of God, from the beauty of God. In what David describes in the opening verses of this psalm as our sitting and our standing and our coming and our going, then I guess when we come to these particular verses in the psalm, then the same question is asked about God's knowledge of us. If we are striving to be in that place that is built on God's deep knowledge and interest and involvement in our lives, God who knows our comings in and our goings out, then God is also there when we see that we're faced with those who are not speaking godly words, not speaking truthful words, those who are living lives of hatred, those who are rising up against the things of God. And David's seeing that difference and saying, I want to live in the ways of God. I want to be in keeping with the things of God. I don't want to find that my time and my energy is spent on the things that are not godly. And so that's a, a real challenge for us, I think. It affects our choices. It affects how we look at our lives and how we seek to spend our lives. That whether we can know when we're in step with God and when actually we're spending our time and our energy with things that are not of the goodness of God. What does that say to us? How does that challenge us? And then it leads us on to the final two verses. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. One version says, see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's tied in with those previous few verses, isn't it? David's final appeal to God is to ensure that he's living as God intends him to live. Know my heart. The heart is often associated in scripture with, with, with purity, with where God would have us be. When our heart is in keeping with God, then our ways are in keeping with God. Know my anxious thoughts, those things that take up our energy, our time. See if there is any wicked way in me. We need God to help us to identify that which is not holy, that which is not us living that set apart life for God and lead me in the way everlasting. That the end result and the continuing living that we're living in now will lead us closer to the heart of God. For us as Christians, you see, everlasting life doesn't begin when we die. It is now. We are living everlasting life now. We are living eternal life now because the promise of God is with us now. So are we living as those whose days are all accounted for and, and those days will lead us into eternity with God? Is that how we're living our lives? And is that reflected in the way we live? So I guess a question for us to go away with. How often do we reaffirm for ourselves that God has been interested in us even before we were born? And therefore God is intensely interested in the outcome of our lives. How does that shape our behaviour, our decisions? How are we developing as God's people in a holy way where our lives fully are set apart by God and for God. Let's pray. Holy God, as we live with the words of this psalm, inspire us by your spirit to understand your truths. In the name of Christ. Amen. Hopefully 
We'll see you later on at half past 12. If not, then have a good day and continue to wrestle with Psalm 139. God bless you.